Ongoing violence and destruction continue in Gaza as attacks also increase across the West Bank. What direction is the conflict headed as it nears its seventh month mark? Hello, I'm Arun Naidu. This is The Heat. Israeli forces have killed more than 34,000 Palestinians in Gaza since October 7th attack on Israel by Hamas fighters. Those figures according to the Gaza Ministry of Health. Hundreds of Palestinians have also been killed by Israeli forces in the occupied West Bank. There are now growing concerns over mass graves uncovered at two hospitals in Gaza that were targeted by Israeli forces. Israel has denied burying bodies. I talked with Mustafa Barghouti, the founder and leader of the Palestinian National Initiative and president of the Palestinian Medical Relief Society, about one of those mass graves in the city of Khan Yunus. The reports we are getting from our medical teams there are appalling. Uh, not only they found 200, more than 280 bodies uh, in a mass uh, grave, which was left by the Israeli army after they've occupied the area, but that mass grave was in the area of a hospital, Nasser Hospital. More than that, many of the victims in that mass grave could not be identified because their bodies have decomposed badly. In addition to the fact that some of the bodies were found decapitated, and many of the bodies were found without their internal organs, some even without their skin which means there is a very good possibility that the Israeli army have used the internal organs of these people killed for their own purposes. It's a very uh, difficult uh, scene to see, and it shows a serious level of atrocity that adds to the war crimes that the Israeli army is committing now in Gaza. Now, the bombings are continuing. You know, last month, the United Nations Security Council adopted a resolution uh, calling for a ceasefire. That resolution was adopted. It was passed. Um, and then, of course, there was the United States uh, saying, calling on Israel, getting an undertaking that there'll be more aid getting into Gaza. Uh, but we're now hearing, just in the past 24 hours, that Israel has carried out some of the fiercest shelling in the past few weeks in northern Gaza. Has anything changed at all since those re that resolution was passed and, and uh, uh, the United States got that undertaking from Israel to allow more aid in? Unfortunately, nothing has changed since the resolution about ceasefire. On the contrary, the Israelis have become, became, have become more ferocious and more aggressive in their uh, war crimes in Gaza. What we witnessed, this is the 200 days of genocide in Gaza. The result of which is 41,000 people killed, including 7,000 who are still missing under the rubble including no less than 15,000 children killed by Israeli bombardment and more than 10,000 women. The vast majority of the people killed are civilians. Add to that more than 77,000 people injured, many of whom will die because they cannot receive proper medical care because Israel has destroyed the medical infrastructure in Gaza. And in addition to that, uh, people are subjected to a terrible amount of collective punishment, the result of which more than 700,000 people in the north are on the edge of starvation, including 350,000 children. What is happening is a terrible atrocity, and Israel would not have dared to commit all these war crimes continuously for 200 days if it wasn't for the American support. If it wasn't for the fact that the United States has been providing the bombs to Israel, the financial aid to Israel, including most recently added to $26 billion of support to the aggressor, to the occupier, which is Israel. To understand the situation, one should compare the double standard between the American positions in Ukraine with that in Palestine. It is absolutely unacceptable, and without this American support, Israel would not have dared to continue this genocide in Gaza. Right. Uh, that uh, money that you're talking about, financial aid, that Israel is getting from the United States, that bill 
uh, will be passed probably uh, today in the United States uh, Congress, 26 billion. Uh, but part of that bill, I mean, a lot of the money goes towards restocking Israeli bombs and missiles, but part of that um, uh, aid also goes to Palestinians in Gaza, doesn't it? I don't believe that, uh, and we will see. We will believe it when we see it. But we know that such an aid that is controlled by U.S. aid will will be uh, totally conditioned, and will be, uh, in my opinion, uh, there will be so many conditions that the real outcome, the real benefit to the people of Gaza will be will be very slim. The most important thing here is that much of that support will go to activities that are under Israeli occupation control and to consolidate the Israeli occupation of Gaza or reoccupation of Gaza. That doesn't lead to peace, and that does not lead to a solution. And what does that little amount of support mean in a situation where Israel has destroyed already 70 percent of all homes, destroyed completely all universities, 33 hospitals out of 36, and destroyed completely the whole infrastructure, yeah. electricity, water supply, sewage systems? One of the outcomes of the Israeli massive destruction is that we have one million people today in Gaza suffering from different diseases, including terrible epidemics like infectious hepatitis. I want to turn now to the situation in the Occupied West Bank, the Occupied West Bank, which is where you are right now. Since October 7th, hundreds of Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank. Uh, a number of Palestinians have also been attacked by settlers uh, in the uh, area. What can you tell us about the situation there now? I've just been to Nur Shams camp, which was invaded by Israel and occupied for several days. What we've seen is also terrible atrocities. People say that now Nur Shams camp resembles what's happening in Gaza. We've met families of no less than 14 uh, people who were killed by the Israeli army, including uh, two children. We've seen the devastation of the infrastructure there. But uh, in total, since the 7th of October, the Israeli army has killed 487 Palestinians in the West Bank and injured more than 4,700, including 19 that were killed by Israeli terrorist settlers' attacks. Today, the settlers are uh, military, are equipped with, with guns uh, provided to them by the Israeli government, and they behave as gangs of terrorists, terrorizing people everywhere. But more than that, the Israeli army arrested more than 8,600 Palestinians since the 7th of October in the West Bank. And the prisoners in Israeli jails, which now exceed 9,000 from the West Bank, are subjected to terrible amount of pressure torture, deprivation of food, and different kinds of uh, torture tactics, including beating them, even sometimes using electrical shocks. Uh, so the, the, on, on, on top of that, the whole West Bank is uh, under siege. Practically, there is uh, 650 or 670 checkpoints, at least, military checkpoints, that divide the country into little ghetto, ghettos separated from each other. And uh, nobody feels safe at all in any place in the West Bank. Are there currently any negotiations taking place between the Palestinians uh, and the Israelis to bring this to an end? Absolutely not. <laughs> Israel has blocked so the implementation of the so-called Oslo Agreement, which was supposed to lead to a two-state solution. And since exactly 10 years, since 2014, uh, all Israeli governments, including Netanyahu's governments, have blocked any contact or any negotiations with the Palestinian side, simply because they are not interested in peace. All they are interested in is to continue their settlement uh, activities in the West Bank, to use settlement activities to, to, to steal Palestinian land, to impose Judaization and annexation of the occupied territories. And, uh, of course, uh, all these Western governments' talks about two-state solution are nothing but hypocrisy, since they are not associated with demands to end Israeli occupation, to end at least the Israeli settlement activities, and to remove settlers from the occupied territories. And since they are also associated with rejection of recognition of a Palestinian state. The United States has just used a veto 
in the Security Council to prevent Palestine becoming a member, a full member of the Palestinian of the, of the United Nations. And that is an indicator, the indication that there is no seriousness about the talk of two-state solution. Uh, on the issue of exchange of prisoners, Israel is blocking also the talks because Netanyahu does not want this war to end. Netanyahu knows very well that the last day of the attack, the war on Gaza, will be the first day of the end of his political career. He knows he could go to jail, because not only because of the four cases of corruption against him, but also because he will be accused of failure on the 7th of October and a failure in running this terrible war. So he is interested in extending the war. He's going, uh, mm -hmm. creating one provocation after the other, mm -hmm. including what you have seen in his attack on the Iranian uh, diplomatic consulate. Uh, one other development, uh, Dr. Barghouti, and that is uh, the report that was uh, published uh, on uh, accusations that UNRWA staff uh, were also members of Hamas. Well, this report says that Israel has provided no evidence. There was an independent commission that conducted this inquiry. But Israel has provided no evidence of any wrongdoing by UNRWA staff. UNRWA, of course, is the main um, agency, UN agency, which provides aid to Palestinians, uh, not only in the occupied territories, but also in, the, in other parts of the Middle East. What is your response to that report? The report has shown very clearly that all Israeli accusations are incorrect and that the Israeli goal from attacking UNRWA is really to attack the right of the Palestinian refugees, the right that has been approved by the United Nations uh, in the resolution 194, which says that uh, all Palestinian refugees who were displaced by Israel in 1948 should be allowed to go back home. And UNRWA would be established as an organization to serve them till the right of return is implemented. Now, Israel made claims that could not provide pro uh, proofs to. Uh, all their claims have proven to be incorrect. But their goal really is to destroy UNRWA, because their ultimate goal is to destroy and liquidate all Palestinian rights, including the right of Palestinian refugees, to nullify, to nullify all UN resolutions that care about Palestinian rights. But as you have said, uh, the report has shown that none of the Israeli accusations is correct. Uh, and that's why I think all governments of the world should, re re should revise their positions and reactivate their support to UNRWA, which is the only organization that can really ta uh, take care of the provision of proper humanitarian aid in Gaza. Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, to discuss this and more, let's bring in our guests. Joining us here in Washington, D.C., Trita Parsi is the executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and an expert on the geopolitics of the Middle East. Also in the U.S. Capitol, Khalil Jashan is the executive director of the Arab Center in Washington, D.C. And from Jerusalem, we're joined by Amot Esael. He is a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute and senior commentator at the Jerusalem Post. Welcome to all of you. Amot, uh, let me start with you. We just heard from Dr. Mustafa Barghouti there painting a very bleak picture, a very dire picture of what life is like for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, he said a lot there, and I want to give you a chance to respond to what he said. Well, first of all, much of what he said is totally baseless and out of his imagination. Stories about and decapitations and skinnings and, and uh, Israeli soldiers in the middle of fighting, digging mass graves, that's unfounded. It cannot be. It hasn't been. And he says it. And you give him all this airtime as if he is a journalist, as if he is in the field. It's unfounded. That's one thing. Secondly, he made a sweeping accusation of everybody about everything, including all the Western governments, which he accused of being hypocritical in seeking a two-state solution. This is, of course, also um, a fantasy. The fact is this, that the whole Western world, including Israel, championed the two-state solution ever since the Oslo process was launched in 1993, and the ones who rejected it continuously and repeatedly were the Palestinians. What he is right about is that as in the aftermath of all this, Israel indeed ended up with the, with the current government, with the Netanyahu era, which is indeed about rejecting any thought or any concept or any possibility mm -hmm. of a two-state solution. 
This is the result of the old violence to which they resorted in the long years between 1993 and Netanyahu's return to power in uh, uh, last decade. And this, of course, he neglects to mention. But this is where the problems lie. This is how we ended up with Hamas. What is the, con the current conflict all about? It's not about nationalism at anymore. This is about fundamentalism. It's about jihadism. What is the common denominator between what we Israelis face in Gaza and what we face in Lebanon from Hezbollah and what we just faced from Iran and what we face from the Houthis in Yemen? Yeah. The common denominator among all these is a jihadism. It's an agenda that is not at all exclusively or narrowly about Israel or about Israel and the Palestinians. It's about imposing their own faith on the rest of mankind. It's easy and convenient for them to start with Israel. Israel is vulnerable. Israel is accusable with impunity. This is what we face, and this is what we have just witnessed on your distinguished program. Khalil Jashan, uh, what is your response to what you just heard there? I mean, you know, we can sense that the divide is very, very deep, the way the two sides view each other. Uh, certainly, the divide is, is very deep. Uh, but at the same time, uh, what we just heard is totally detached uh, from, from reality. I mean, a, a modicum of, of, of uh, uh, reasonable uh, analysis is, is expected from those of us who claim to be uh, analysts uh, in this regard. Denial is not going to help. Uh, I mean, Amos is, is for example, uh, complaining about uh, 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 the, the region going into fundamentalism. I mean, who, who brought fundamentalism into this region? Who brought religion into this conflict? Uh, the state of the Jewish people did, uh, long before there was fundamentalism on the, on the Palestinian side. Uh, so, uh, you know, before you throw stones, uh, one in, in this conflict particularly, uh, one uh, needs to be uh, rational uh, in, in, in doing so. And uh, if your house uh, is, is, is made out of glass, uh, I would suggest that you avoid uh, throwing stones at, at other people. I mean, all the accusations he made are, are typical accusations. Those of, us, those of us who grew up in Palestine and in the Middle East grew up uh, watching all that stuff uh, being committed uh, by, by, by Israel. Uh, so denial uh, yeah. is, is continuing. It's getting worse. Uh, I mean, Amos is probably uh, not necessarily one of the most radical Israelis I've ever met. But if, if that's, uh, uh, frankly, a, a moderate Israeli, uh, I hate to be uh, 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 right. listening to, to uh, the, the, the okay. Israelis from the current government, for example. Trita Parsi, one of the things we heard from Mustafa Barghouti there was that if the United States did not support Israel in the way it does, financially as well as militarily, then this would not have gone on for so long. We would not see the numbers of casualties that we are seeing. But when we look at President's, uh, President Biden's policy, it seems to be confusing in one sense, contradictory in many ways. He's expressing concern whenever he can for the humanitarian situation in Gaza, but at the same time is, is, continues to approve money for weapons for Israel. I mean, how does one explain that? Well, first of all, if the United States from the outset of this had put some limits on Israel and then at least uh, a few weeks into this had ag agreed and allowed for a ceasefire to take place instead of vetoing three resolutions at the UN Security Council, either calling for a humanitarian pause or uh, a ceasefire. And the last one that was allowed to pass with an American abstention the Biden administration immediately turned around and undermined by erroneously calling it non-binding. So if you had this from the very beginning, I think this conflict would have ended, or at least the, the intense fighting or the bombardment by Israel would have ended much sooner. And I also do think that would have been a far greater chance of getting the Israeli hostages out. Um, uh, the connection between the release of the hostages and a ceasefire, unfortunately, has led to a situation in which there's neither a ceasefire or uh, the release of the hostages. So, uh, fundamentally, the United States, unfortunately, under Biden, has allowed this conflict to go on much, much longer than it should. And the United States, given all of the arms that it's been sending Israel, given the pace in which the ammunition has been used by Israel, could certainly have put an end to this much, much sooner by putting some real red lines in front of Israel and push all parties towards a ceasefire. 
Amat, you know, every day we get figures on the number of casualties uh, in Gaza, in the West Bank as well, and those numbers are rising every day. I mean, we heard that figure of 34,000 people being killed. Some estimates put it as high as 41,000. But the question is, what is Israel's ultimate goal? We have heard from the Prime Minister, and he says the goal is to defeat Hamas. But after six months, almost we're entering the seventh month right now of this conflict, uh, it's very hard to tell how seriously uh, Hamas has been degraded, and no hostages have been released through the military offensive. So what is the goal right now? First of all, the numbers, the question about the numbers yeah. is how they're gathered, and nobody knows. All we know is that they come from one source only, and that, that source, besides being tendentious, is commanded by Hamas. They are hardly an objective or an impartial source. So. With your permission, and with all due respect, I doubt the figures. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that the truth will come out, and we'll then see that the numbers that everybody is quoting right. are at best uh, inaccurate and at worst invented. That's one thing. I'm not denying at all that there are many casualties out there. There is a war. We didn't start this war. We, we responded. We've been attacked. We've been invaded. We've been slaughtered. We've been butchered. And we, our women were raped systematically by 3,000 invaders. This is how things began. That's one thing. Secondly, to end all this, yes, Hamas can be, can bring everything to an end tonight if it first shows us the hostages and then strikes a deal to release them. They should, these are not, most of them, are not soldiers. These are civilians pulled out of their beds. That's why we have a conflict right now. This is why there is violence right now. This is what the world should be demanding of them to deliver before anything else can transpire. Now you're asking rightly, where does the fighting go from where it has already arrived? So I say to that, that now I'm speaking simply as, a, as an observer. Um, my impression is that uh, Israel is right now regrouping in order to um, eventually, I don't know at what time, but to eventually assault the outstanding pocket of organized Hamas uh, military formation that is in Rafa in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. I think that there will be an assault over there because there is over there um, a good number of Hamas fighters, unlike the rest of the Strip, where all of their formations have been attacked and all of their formations have been dismantled and much of their material as well. This has been done with. The remainder is down south. There is no progress in terms of the a uh, hostage situation, and I therefore think that, militarily speaking, this is where things will proceed in Gaza. Beyond that, everyone in Israel is convinced that we're in for some serious fighting up north with Hezbollah in Lebanon, because the dynamics seem to be headed only in one direction yeah. out there. And, of course, hovering above all this is Iran. Khalil Jashan, you know, as uh, Amos says, the fighting will continue. There's also the possibility that Israel will launch that grant offensive on the um, Rafah area in uh, southern Gaza. Um, as I pointed out uh, earlier on, you know, the ceasefire uh, resolution was adopted at the United Nations Security Council. Um, it doesn't seem that Israel is abiding by that, looking at recent events. Um, most recently, we heard UNRWA, the aid organization, issue a statement in the past 24 hours saying its aid trucks are now being blocked by Israel from entering northern Gaza with aid. So the question is, what other recourse do Palestinians have to bring an end to this? Uh, I think what you just described uh, is, is accurate. Uh, even though there has been many attempts at uh, ceasefire, Israel is not interested in that. The prime minister of Israel officially announced on the eve of the Passover uh, what his intentions are and the intentions of his government uh, is, is to proceed. He said he's going to hit. He's going to hit harder and uh, more intensely and, and uh, in a more targeted yeah. manner than he has done in the past. So we have to take him uh, for his words. That's what uh, he's done uh, in the past. And, and the fact that, uh, you know, what uh, your guests described earlier in terms of the U.S. position sheltering uh, Israel, both uh, uh, in the field and, and uh, at the United Nations in, in terms of diplomatic efforts, uh, same thing in Cairo, same thing in Doha. Uh, the U.S. Uh, decided to reduce uh, itself from a superpower 
uh, essentially into an advocate or, or, or a lawyer uh, for Israel in terms of continuing this fight. And it doesn't believe. I think Biden personally, mm -hmm. uh, uh, judging from meetings with his uh, uh, close uh, uh, aides, uh, I, I don't think is convinced that Israel has gotten enough revenge uh, out of this war. So he feels that, uh, and his administration feels that Israel has the right mm -hmm. to continue. Yeah. Uh, to do so. When will the U.S. Uh, or, or Israel's insatiable appetite for revenge, uh, revenge uh, will be met? Okay. Uh, who knows? So I think yeah. it's going to continue. Trudy Parsley, we've heard President Biden uh, repeatedly proclaim his support for Israel. But if we look at what happened recently, some things have changed. The U.S. abstained in that Security Council vote that we were talking about. And then, in what would appear to be an unprecedented act, the U.S. plans to sanction an Israeli army unit. This has prompted a very fierce response from the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Let's listen to some of what he had to say about that. And again, I will fiercely defend the Israeli Defense Forces, our army and our fighters. If anyone thinks they can impose sanctions on a unit of the IDF, I will fight it with all my strength. As our soldiers are united to protect us on the battlefield, we are united to protect them on the political field. Together we will fight, and with God's help, together we will win. So, Trudeau, what do you read into this, these changes uh, that the United States has adopted? Frankly, not much, because at the end of the day, if there is going to be a real change, that change needs to go way beyond this in order to be able to bring this to an end. I think the administration is reacting to the massive popular pressure, uh, particularly amongst young people, to right. end what has been uh, support for what Biden himself calls indiscriminate bombing by the Israelis. In the case of earlier sanctions, for instance, that was imposed on some seven settlers uh, in uh, uh, Israel. We saw yeah. that later on the Biden administration backed down from that. So yeah. whether these new sanctions really are going to be right. uh, as much as they have been presented as remains to be seen. Yeah. And we have to leave it there. We have run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thank you.